So at the end of class last time, we talked about introducing bivariate random variables in both the discrete and continuous case. Let's continue with that today here, but let's put it in the context of an application this time. How about you and me doing free throws? Okay, in different, different locations. So we're gonna be uh, thinking about independent free throws. We're gonna try to come up with a model where the independence assumption is satisfied. So X is the number of free throws I make in, oh, we need to keep the number small here, two attempts. And let's let Y be the number of free throws you make in three attempts. Now we could imagine this to be a game situation, but to keep things simple, we're just shooting free throws in our respective driveway, and then we're calling each other and reporting what, what we found, what happened. X is going to be binomial with n equal to 2. And for me, remember, I'm a terrible free throw shooter. Well, I guess not the worst free throw shooter in the world, but I'm not good enough to play basketball. My probability of success is 0.4. You, let's say you're better than me. Your probability of success is, let's say, 0.7. N is three for you. I started to write an N there, and so I crossed it off. <clears throat> so we got these two separate discrete random variables. We can certainly tie our two variables together into a vector variable. That is a bivariate random variable a two-dimensional discrete random variable. Discrete bivariate random variable. And come up with a joint PDF here, or P PMF if we're talking discrete. Think of it as a probability mass function. I did realize after class on Tuesday that I was putting the X and the Y directions in the table different than the book did, they make X go along the leftward column and Y go along the top. I don't know that that's the best choice. It sort of makes more sense for me to think of X going left to right and Y going up and down because that's more consistent with X and Y axes. But here I'll do it consistent with the book. So here are the possibilities for the values of X and Y. We could fill in the numbers with a spreadsheet. That'd be nice and quick. That probably is what we should do. Before I do that though, we need to talk about how to come up with these numbers based on what are really the marginal distributions. This is a little different than what we I talked about on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I emphasized the joint distribution, whether it's a PMF for a discrete or a PDF for continuous is what you come up with first. And from that, you either do summations or you do integrals to find the marginal PMFs or PDFs. But here, it's gonna actually, because of this applied situation, it's gonna make more sense to come up with the values of the PMFs for X and Y individually, and then use those to come up with the values of the joint. But how? If you know the marginal values, how can you figure out the numbers on the table? After all, don't you have to add the numbers on the table to figure out the marginal values? How can I go in reverse? Assume independence, that's how. We're going to assume independence. Now, if we are ta taking free throws in the same location, the same driveway at the same time, kind of competing against each other. Maybe, you know, I, I'm i intimidated by you and I see you made all three of your free throws and it just makes me scared and I, 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 I miss both of them. Did my probability of success go down? That would not be independence. Maybe that would happen, maybe it wouldn't, I don't know. But if we're in separate locations and we're not talking with each other and the weather's the same and equivalent conditions, it makes sense. It's reasonable to assume independence. And remember, with independence, 
this equation is true. The value of the joint PMF is the product of the values of the marginal PMFs. That's the definition of independence. I did mention on Tuesday that this is an equivalent equation as independence from chapter two, because this is the probability that x equals little x and y equals little y, and and corresponds to intersection. And this is the probability that x equals little x times the probability that y equals little y with no conditional probabilities in here. It is the multiplication rule for independent events. These are probabilities when x and y are discrete. Probability mass function, PMF. It's not a PDF, no integrals here. These values really do give you probabilities. In the continuous case, these functions are densities. They're no longer probabilities. You have to integrate them to find probabilities. But you still take this equation as the definition of independence in the continuous case. It still makes sense to do that, though it's harder to explain. Anyway, let's use a spreadsheet to do this more quickly to fill in these values. Okay, so I got the X values along this column, zero, one, two, those are my free throws. Y values along the row, those are the number of free throws you make. My PMF for my binomial distribution, the marginal values are gonna go over here, corresponding to me attempting two free throws. So I would need to do equals binome, if I can type binome dist, Number of successes is going to come from the col B column, comma. Number of trials for me is going to be two. Probability of success is 0.4. Cumulative, no. Not a CDF. Put a false, you can also put a zero. My chance of making zero is 0.36. One out of two is 0.48. And that leaves how much? Uh, 0.16 for this last one? Yeah. There is my PMF values for making zero, one, or two free throws. For you, binome dist, your successes are up there. Number of trials is three. Probability of success is 0.7. You're not likely to miss all three. Cumulative, no. That's a small probability. And they, the largest probability is making two out of three. So these are marginal PDF, PMF values. This one along the bottom there is F sub Y of Y. That's you. You are Y. I'm X. And these values are F sub X of X. Marginal values. Now the numbers in here have to be the joint values, f sub xy of xy. Uh, unfortunately, since these are in such weird spots, there's no way to do a nice formula for that works for all of these. Well, okay, actually, I, I can do a little copying and pasting here. Let's see. I, for example, in C, cell C3, I could do, let's see, equals C dollar six times uh, dollar G three. The dollar signs are, are called, what are called um, absolute cell references. It's gonna keep, and I'm gonna copy and paste this to the left, this formula. The dollar sign in front of the six is gonna keep the row six fixed as I copy and paste to the left, but not the C, not the column C. It'll become a D, then an E, then an F. The dollar sign in front of the G will keep column G fixed which I do want to keep fixed as I copy and paste to the left here. The three does not have a dollar sign. I mean, that'll in each row, it, it'll be the right thing there. I think this works. <laughs> I don't want to take the time to explain it. I'm going to first copy and paste this downward and then copy and paste this entire thing to the right. This should work. 
I believe the sum of all those things should be one. Some highlight all those. Yep, you can see it's a one. I think I did the cell programming right. These numbers now are the values of the PMF, the joint PMF. If you want to take the time to write those down, if you started to write my table there, go ahead and do that. You started making a table in your notes like this. Go ahead and write those numbers down. It's probably worthwhile. If you didn't, you don't, you don't have to. What would be good to do with this now? I mean, we can use this to find probabilities. That's one thing we can do with it. For example, well, here's a slightly tricky problem that came up on your homework. Find the probability that I make one free throw or you make two free throws. I purposely put the word or in there. What's the probability that I make one free throw? Can I find my pen here? P that X equals one or Y equals two. You had things like this on your assignment. Purposely put a or, that's like a union. What can be done to find this probability? Well, you need to add up values in the table. You also can use the general addition rule. This would be the probability that X equals one plus the probability that Y equals two minus the probability that X equals one and Y equals two. And and corresponds to intersection. I could use the general addition rule. I also could add these numbers which add to 0.48, you can see, and then add these two numbers on top of that, right? Same as doing 0.848 plus 0.441 minus this thing, because that would be double counted. That's the general addition rule in this context. I'll say it again. Same thing as doing, this formula down here, the general addition rule is really doing the 0.48 plus 0.441 minus the 0.21168 is this probability right there. So the answer would be, this plus this minus that. 0 0.71 approximately is the probability that I make one free throw or you make two free throws. Either I make one, or you make two or both. It's another way, another way to think about that. Well, actually, I should say either I make one and you do not make two, or you make two and I do not make one, or we both do what I'm saying I make one and you make two. Different ways of thinking about it. So you can find probabilities from this. You can also find expected values. What are the expected values? You can think of it in terms of what we learned in chapter three. What do we learn in chapter three? I will still show this table here. We learn in chapter three that the expected value of X, for example, would be the sum in the discrete case here over all X of X times the PMF values. Maybe I want to put a subscript capital X here to emphasize this is a joint context. So this is a marginal PMF, which means it really is the PMF for X itself. So coming back to the spreadsheet, I can, for example, create a new column here. x times f sub x of x. So I'm multiplying the numbers in column B with the corresponding number in column G. Equals B2 times G2. B was where the x's were. G is where the PMF values are for my free throws. Oops. Isn't that right? B, oh, B3. Sorry, I'm in, not two. B3 times G3. There we go. Of course, that turns out to be zero because zero was the first value of X. 
add these to get my mean 0.8, which is also n times p, right? Two times 0.4. That's what shortcut formula is for the mean of a binomial. I could do something similar for you. Define your mean. There's y times your PMF value. Find all those, add them up. Should be the same as three times 0.7. But as you read about, and maybe it was in the homework too, we're interested in other kinds of expectations. Like the expected value of X plus Y. There's two ways this can be done. You can either add over all Y and all X, the joint PMF values, oh, mistake, sorry. All Y and all X, X plus Y times the joint PMF values, or what's easier, if we've got the expected value of X and Y individually already is just add those. Actually, we already knew in chapter three that that was true, though we haven't proved that. Proving that these are equal is not obvious. It's not obvious that these are equal. Not obviously equal, but they are. After all, to do this by itself, you have to use the marginal PMF and to do this one, you'd have to, of X, and for this one, you'd have to do the marginal PMF for Y, not the joint. So why would these end up being equal? Do we need to assume independence or something? Turns out you don't have to assume independence. It's also a little weird because, you know, the summations get weird. The values of X and Y that they range over kind of is weird. So it's it's not not obviously that these are, are equal, but they turn out to be. Um. So again, the quickest way to do this would be, not that, just to add these two numbers, 2.1 plus 0.8 is 2.9. That would be the long run average number of free throws that we together make. If I keep shooting two and writing down how many, how many I make, and you keep shooting three and writing down how many you make. So I'm writing down a bunch of zeros, ones, and twos, and you're writing down a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. We're adding our numbers in each case. If I make one, you make three, Together we made four. What's the long run average after we add our answers together? It's gonna to be 2.9. Oh, can we figure it out? How would I how would I figure it out with the other formula? I don't want to actually do it because it would just take too long. How would I actually figure it out with this formula? Right here, it's a bit of a pain. I'd have to go zero times zero or zero plus zero times that. 0 plus 1 times that, 0 plus 2 times that, 1 plus 0 times that, 1 plus 1 times that, 1 plus 2 times that. Yeah. All right, you saw this in the textbook with these examples written out and maybe came up in your homework like this. Kind of a pain. We'd like to avoid doing that if we can, as much as we can. That's not the only kind of joint expectation, you might call this, of interest. It's also of interest to compute the expected value of X times Y. Putting a dot in there, but typically we don't bother. <clears throat> That's gonna be the sum over all X and all Y. I, I switched the X and the Y around there for no good reason, but other than just to emphasize we can of X times Y times the joint P MF. 
And this is worth doing in this way right now, even though it will be kind of a pain. We will be able to save some work here because every time either X or Y is zero, the answer will be zero. That'll save us some work. There's no other formula for this. It's not the expected value of X times the expected value of Y. In fact, we're about to talk about something called the covariance that emphasizes that. I cannot compute this in general as the expected value of X times the expected value of Y. It's only very special when you can. So you have to pretty much do that summation. Okay, let's just do it as fast as we can here. Again, anytime either X or Y is zero, I get a zero. So I can ignore these numbers and I can ignore these numbers. Stop it. There. I can just focus on these six numbers. I only have to add six things in the end. So I'll, I'll do the, the X times Y in my head. So the first one, corresponding to this first number 0 0.06 is, oh no 0 0.09072 it corresponds to x is 1 x is 1 y is 1 1 times 1 is 1 so i just get that i'll go to the next number over to the right x is 1 y is 2 1 times 2 is 2 2 times this go to the next number over x is 1 y is 3 1 times 3 is 3 i get 3 times this here, x is 2, y is 1, 2 times 1 is 2, so I get 2 times this. I'm multiplying the x and the y before I also multiply times the joint PMF value. So this one, x is 2 and y is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, times that. And finally, for this one, x is 2, y is 3, 2 times 3 is 6, so I get 6 times this. If I've not made a mistake, that should be the expected value of x times y, 1.68. What does it represent? Every time I shoot two free throws and write down how many I make, every time you shoot three free throws and write down how many you make, we text each other and say, oh, I made one, you made three. The product of the number we made is one times three is three. Write down a three as the observed value of x times y for that round. Do it again and again and again and again, oh, hundreds of times. The long run average of our products is, if I've done it right, is 1.68. Who cares? Why would we care about this? We might wonder whether our values are correlated in some way. Because of how I constructed this example, assuming independence, they're not going to be. But in general, before you can calculate how they're correlated, you have to calculate something called the covariance. The definition of the covariance, not the variance, but the covariance, this is evidently gonna be some kind of measure of how X and Y vary together. And since we're independent of each other. They're probably not going to vary together at all. We're probably going to get a covariance of zero for our example. But the definition of this is the expected value of the product of X minus its mean and Y minus its mean. That's a definition. Intuitively, if Values of X bigger than its mean tend to be associated with values of Y bigger than its mean and vice versa. Values of X lower than its mean are associated with values of Y lower than its mean. More often than not, these products will tend to be positive. I'm thinking in terms of observed values. And this expectation as being a theoretical mean will probably be positive. On the other hand, if values of X that are bigger than the mean of X tend to be associated with values of Y that are less than its mean, making this positive and that negative, and vice versa, 
when x is less than its mean, y tends to be bigger than its mean. Then again, imagining data, observed values of this product will tend to be negative more often than positive in that case. The ex expectation being a long run theoretical mean in that case would be negative. Somewhere in between, you get zero, I guess. How do you actually compute this though? Well, you go ahead and you multiply this out. FOIL, so here I'm just using FOIL. X times Y is XY, oh, that looks familiar. X times mu Y is mu Y times X. Outside times outside, inside times inside is minus mu X Y, and last times last is plus mu X times mu Y. Oh, then expected value is linear which I mentioned up here, but didn't prove. So this is the expected value of x, y minus the expected value of mu, y, x, minus the expected value of mu, x, y, plus the expected value of mu, x times mu, y. But wait a minute, yes, expected values linear. I can also factor out these constants. And this is, not a variable, it's a constant. So it's expected values itself. So I get the expected value of X times Y minus mu Y times the expected value of X minus mu X times the expected value of Y plus mu X times mu Y. But wait a minute again, expected value of X is just mu X and the expected value of Y is just mu Y. Uh, say this thing cancels with that. This all simplifies to the expected value of X times Y minus mu X times mu Y, which can be written as the expected value of X times the expected value of Y. There is the shortcut formula that people use. What are the reasons for these steps? This is linearity. This is linearity as well. And the fact that the expected value of a constant is itself. And this one is just simplification. Algebra. That's how you compute the covariance. We've found in the spreadsheet the expected value of x times y. I guess we, we know these two as well. Let's see what the covariance is for this example. It should be zero. Where'd that come from? What's the product of the expected value of X with the expected value of Y? 0. 0.8 times 2.1, 1.68. That's expected value of X times expected value of Y. Therefore, the covariance of X and Y is the difference. And since those are the same, the covariance for this example is zero. When X and Y are independent, the covariance will be zero. That's a theorem. If X and Y are independent, the covariance will be zero. You might also hope that that's an if and only if. You might hope that if the covariance is zero, then X and Y are independent. Unfortunately, it's not an if and only if. And one example suffices to disprove that conjecture. I'll just show you the book's example. This table is one example that disproves the conjecture that if the covariance is zero, then X and Y are independent. That conjecture is false. The covariance of these two is zero. Uh, is that easy to verify? Uh, let's see here. Turns out that they talk about it down here. Both of these quantities are zero. Expected value of y is zero and the expected value of x times y is zero. 
um, focus on the expected value of x times y. The reason that expectation is zero. Uh, I believe is, I'm not going to show you the details. I believe what you get is cancellation. I mean, a lot of these joint PMF values are zero. So those contribute to that sum as a zero. Uh, the four times negative two times one fourth gets canceled out by the four times positive two times one fourth when you add them. Same with these, the one times negative one times one fourth gets canceled out by the one times positive one times one fourth when you add them. That's a quick verbal verification that this expectation is zero. So the covariance is going to be this zero minus the product of these two, zero. Zero minus zero is zero. The covariance is zero for this example, but these are not independent random variables. For one thing, the numbers on the table are not the products of the numbers in the marginal PMFs here. Those zeros are not products of non-zero numbers. For another thing, there's a very tight relationship between X and Y. If you know X, excuse me, if you know Y, you know X. If Y is plus or minus two, X must be four. Zero probability of being one. If Y is plus or minus one, X must be one. Zero probability of being four. X equals Y squared, actually. Plus or minus two squared is four, plus or minus one squared is one. There's a formula relating X and Y. They are definitely not independent, but the covariance is zero. So yes, this theorem here, actually the theorem is stated a little differently. This theorem says if X and Y are independent, then the expected value of X times Y equals the product of the expected value of X with the expected value of Y. That also implies the covariance is zero. But this is one direction. It does not say if this is true, then X and Y are independent. That seems very unfortunate, but we have to live with it. It's not an if it only is. In our remaining time, we better do continuous examples. And let's do that in Mathematica. <clears throat> there we are. We're going to, for sake of quickness, I'm going to have Mathematica do the relevant integrals. So you may want to just focus on listening. You can have Mathematica do your integrals, but you should probably practice these integrals. They're, they're not real hard integrals. Okay. Say I would like to have a probability density function for a continuous bivariate random variable proportional to, oh, say, x plus 2y over some rectangle. What rectangle? How about x going from 1 to 3 and y going from 2 to 5? So my PN, this is not my PDF yet. It's going to be proportional. My my PDF is going to be this function times some constant in front. You got a problem or two like this. What's that constant? It needs to integrate to one. I put dy in the inside and dx in the outside, meaning the inner integrals with respect to y, y going from two to five. The outer integrals with respect to x, x going from one to three. So if I took the time to draw a rectangle, I'd draw a rectangle where x goes from one to three and y goes from two to five. This integral is 54. If you do it by hand, you'd want to do the inner integral first with respect to y. Imagine integrating this with respect to y and only treating the x like a constant, like a number. You integrate that with respect to y, you get x times y, because x is a constant, plus y squared. Y going from two to five, you plug in those numbers, you get something that depends on X. This is the marginal PDF of X, where X goes from one to three. You would integrate that then from one to three. 
and get one or get 54 because it's not a PDF yet, sorry. This 54 tells you what the constant should be, 1 54th. So if I put a 1 54th in front of this, then I'm going to get a PDF over this rectangle. I get an integral of one now. This then will be the marginal PDF with respect to X and that will integrate to one. I could also find the marginal PDF with respect to Y by integrating the joint PDF, this thing, with respect to X from one to three, treating Y as constant. So if I do that, I have not done that yet. I could copy and paste this inner integral, but change the Y to an X and change the interval from me to being one to three. And that thing should integrate to one if I integrate it from two to five. Again, Y is going between two and five here. X is going between one and three. So I know that went quick. Again, first I was trying to find the joint PDF to be proportional to X plus two Y. It's gonna be some constant times X plus two Y. By doing the integral without the 154th there, I got 54 telling me I needed to put a 154th there to make sure it integrates to one. When I integrate that with respect to Y, that joint PDF with respect to Y, I get something that depends on X. When you do the integral, you treat X like a constant. But once you got the answer, then you can think of X as a variable. And that will be your marginal PDF with respect to X. I could define it here if I like. where X goes between one and three. And I could replace this, I could redo the integral and put an FX of X and get a one. This one gives you the marginal PDF of Y. Let me do a little copying and pasting here as well. This right here is the marginal PDF of Y. It's found by integrating the joint PDF with respect to X, the X goes away, but there's still a Y there. And once again, I could have done this integral by integrating FY. Once you've done all this, you can do everything we did in the discrete case. You can find means, for example, the expected value of X can be found by integrating x times the marginal PDF of x. x goes from one to three. This will be the expected value of x. The expected value of y can be found by integrating the marginal PDF of y. With respect to y, y goes from two to five. What about the expected value of X times Y? Or X plus Y, let's do them both. What the, about the expected value of X plus Y? You can do it two ways. You can either add 55 27 and 11 thirds to get the answer, or you could integrate the joint X plus Y times the joint PDF. Copy and paste this down here. I know I'm going fast. That's why it's best just to listen. Should get the same answer? Yeah. If you had to do this by hand, you'd want to do the inner integral first. You'd want to multiply by X plus Y, the joint PDF. You'd get a quadratic in X and Y. You'd get some X squareds and Y squareds in there if you did that. You'd integrate with respect to Y get something that depends on X and then you'd integrate that with respect to X. And if you switch around the order of X and Y, you, you should get the same answer. If I make the outer integral with respect to Y and the inner integral with respect to X, it's a fact in multivariable calculus where that when you switch around the order of integration, as long as your function is nice, you should get the same answer.
for sake of time, I've been approaching this very symbolically. It can all be interpreted graphically too. Graphs of such functions are surfaces and double integrals are volumes under surfaces. That's in the reading. Just haven't had time to talk about that. What about the expected value of x times y? Replace this x plus y with an x times y. And just like in the discrete case, there's no other way to do it. At least in general. Maybe there's another way to do it if your variables are independent. That's the expected value of x times y. So now the covariance, the covariance would be expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x. What was that? 55 27 times the expected value of y. Stop that. Where did that come from? No, I have to at the time. The expected value of y was the 11 thirds. This would be our shortcut formula for the covariance. Is it going to be zero? Probably not. Negative. These variables are slightly negatively correlated. Is there intuition as to why? Not now. Final thing I'll say. A couple things I'll say today is what's the actual correlation? We just computed the covariance. What's the correlation? Is the covariance the correlation? No, it's not. The correlation is another number that's essentially kind of like a scaled version of the covariance. It's labeled with the Greek letter rho. The correlation between x and y is the ratio of the covariance divided by the square root of the product of the individual variances. Somehow this takes the covariance and scales it in a way that's easier to interpret. Here's one way to interpret it, this theorem. This correlation coefficient rho for any two va random variables is always between negative one and one. Never bigger than one, never less than negative one. This rescaling never allows you to get a correlation of two or negative 1.3. And another special thing is if the correlation happens to equal plus or minus one, its absolute value is plus one, then there's an exact linear relationship between the variables. They are perfectly correlated, you might say, with a linear function. Okay, so even though I haven't done example calculations with this, it's something you should be able to do on the homework. Just use these formulas, okay? We'll talk about what it means more next Tuesday.